welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about healthcare systems. And this is a really important area uh, to understand because if you uh, want to actually effectively improve public health systems, understanding the different parts, understanding how they interrelate, uh, and understanding the different areas of opportunity to intervene to improve healthcare is actually really important uh, skills to have as someone entering these fields. So this uh, lecture really provides an overview of healthcare systems in general. Now, the lecture, that being said, unlike my previous lectures, this lecture really follows very much directly from the Regelman and Kirkwood textbook, um, largely because we're covering such a wide range of material, I feel like it's uh, best to really focus in on the key points that were addressed in the chapters. So uh, you can go there for more information on these types of ideas, and here I'm just providing a general overview. All right, so let's talk about, start, start off talking about chapter nine. So here we're really talking about the, the healthcare workforce, particularly in uh, clinical settings. So what are health professionals? So health professionals is a term that's a ge fairly general term, but really referring to people who uh, provide or support improving health for individuals or populations. So uh, specifically, we're talking about nurses and physicians, public health workers, allied health more broadly, uh, psychologists, etc. So these are folks who would really be seen as being health professionals. Now, when you think about the education of health professionals, training them to make sure that they can do their jobs, there's a few different ideas that you should be aware of. The first is accreditation. So this is uh, uh, an approval to a, a educational institution to actually provide a degree in a certain health-related field. So in order to be able to do this, the institution has to have received accreditation uh, by some oversight body. Credentialing is the process of certifying or providing a degree that indicates that someone has uh, learned the information that they need to have in that specific topic area. All right. So uh, uh, institutions that are accredited are capable of providing that those credentials. Now, uh, another component to this is licensing. So you can have credentials, you can graduate for, from a program, but for many different types of health professions, you actually need a license from the state that you're working in to be approved to actually practice in, in your field. So um, you can get credentialing through a degree or certification or some sort of test, but very often you also have to get that license uh, where there's certain criteria from your state or your region to say, yes, you can actually practice uh, as a nurse or as a physician, etc. So um, those are different terms that you should be aware of in understanding the, the workforce, workforce development and the different areas in which uh, accountability and quality is considered uh, in, in those processes. Now, when we think about the different types of institutions that uh, healthcare is provided within, uh, there is uh, uh, sort of a ranking across them. The first is primary care, and primary care is really the component that works most closely with public health in the sense that these are the providers uh, that people go to where they provide essential basic services across areas and find out, figure out what's going on um, so that people can be treated or referred appropriately. All right. Uh, they often take care of many of the basic services that are involved in prevention for people, helping people quit smoking, for example, or helping people watching people's blood pressure, for example. So uh, primary care is really very important uh, in, in public health systems. Secondary care is uh, referring to specialty care. So specialty care is where you are, uh, someone has been referred because they have a very specific problem that needs uh, a clinician that has very focused expertise in that specific area. So on an organ system or a specific type of service. So that's what secondary care refers to, it's essentially specialty care. 
Tertiary care is care that it isn't talking to a specific type of, type of professional, but it's talking about an institution that typically provides a more specialized service. So burn units or, um, or oncology centers. These are uh, institutions that really focus in on a specific type of health problem and have a lot of expertise at that institution. So that's tertiary care. So again, primary care is really essential to public health processes because uh, they, they provide a lot of these basic services for ensuring health. Uh, shots, for example, and uh, monitoring of different types of health conditions help with losing weight, for example. All right. Um, but the way our healthcare system is set up, a lot of our focus and a lot of our money actually goes to specialty care. So we actually have a shortage of primary care clinicians. We actually only about a third of our clinicians are uh, involved in primary care. So uh, that is a problem uh, for our healthcare system that we have where so much of our money and so much of our attention goes into specialty care as opposed to taking care, care of it at a, a primary care level. So, um, but when we think about primary care, there's a few different things that we are considering in terms of improving that primary care. So ideally, when we think about primary care, we want primary care to be the first point of contact for people who go and trying to receive services. So um, ideally, uh, people will come into primary care to get access to problems when they have a health care problem. However, what we're finding is that people come into primary care from a lot of different come into the healthcare system through many different access points. So through the ER or uh, uh, complementary alternative medicines or other types of, or maybe go directly to specialists. So we don't have the best system for ensuring that people go into primary care first to get appropriately referred or uh, treatment treated. The goal for primary care is also that we would want it to be comprehensive in terms of making sure that uh, we can deal with the majority of different types of health problems. So um, what we find is that because of the pace of how things are going and uh, the wide range of different types of treatments that we now have, increasingly a lot of people get referred off to specialty care instead. Uh, so that is another challenge for uh, primary care uh, approaches. The hope is that we'd also have primary care be uh, effectively coordinated. Um, so uh, the point here being that we try and bring people together to, uh, to uh, connect them and communicate uh, across different types of uh, approaches. Uh, and that um, what we find is that there is a bit of a shift in terms of how this coordination occurs uh, within institutions. Uh, that we have this rise of hospitalists um, who um, are at the hospital, but uh, maybe often referring people off to specialists as well. Um, there's also the idea of continuity. Uh, continuity is the idea that we uh, a patient is followed over time uh, with uh, the same clinicians, hopefully, so the clinicians get to know them over time. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, by knowing them, they'll provide better care uh, during during that during that process. Now, the problem with continuity is that people very often switch providers relatively often, and that's due to insurance related concerns. Where you know your insurance changes because you change a job, and very often people have to go and find a new provider. So there are challenges there as well. And then caring that's also connected to the idea of having that continuity of care and connection. Uh, where we really want people to have these individual relationships. But um, again, there's a problem problems there with the administrative uh, levels that uh, prevents this long-term care relationship from uh, evolving. And also that we have um, other administrative tasks that can sometimes interfere with having those connections. And then uh, another goal of primary care is that uh, we would like uh, for people to be effectively connected between primary care and community ser services. So, for example, if you have a patient who has uh, weight challenges, you want to be able to connect them up to, with local gyms or local public health services. And the truth is, is that sometimes our primary care is not very well connected into public health services. These preventive type strategies are existing in the community. 
so there's a real need to improve our ability to c build connections between primary care and public health services. All right. So another thing that you should understand about uh, pu public health, uh, health providers is how uh, clinicians and healthcare settings are actually compensated for the work that they do. So um, the first method for doing this is called fee for service. And this is historically one of the earlier strategies for providing um, healthcare. So the idea here is essentially what it sounds like that uh, you have a provider um, and the provider gets paid for the different things that they do uh, to provide that health care. So um, there they're providing for the, ser the services, the actions, the things that they actually provide. Um, so uh, there's some advantage to this. It's, there's a one-to-one -one ratio in terms of work done and outputs, but uh, and that might encourage some efficiency in terms of providing that fast and efficiently. Um, but it doesn't always uh, provide payment for some things like interactions, for counseling, for conversations. So we might get less, um, less uh, effectiveness there. Um, it also, when we're paying for services, there's an incentive to offer more services, right? So I get paid more as a clinician if I do more tests or I do more things, right? So that could be add inefficiency into healthcare systems where we're providing more uh, than we necessarily need. All right. So uh, capitation is another uh, financial strategy for compensation. So here's where our clinicians provide a set amount for uh, a certain number of patients that they have under their care, all right? They get a set amount of time, uh, money per month that they have those uh, patients in their, in their care. And um, there's some advantages to using this strategy. This is a strategy often used by HMOs. And the idea here is that because they're getting the same amount of, amount of money, regardless of whether they're offering services or not, uh, that it would encourage preventive care. So if you, uh, in a healthcare system, that you would hope that uh, by doing this, that you would actually decrease the incentive to offer more tests, to do more things, just to build up the amount of money that you're that you're getting. All right. Um, so that's one of the main advantages of this. However, the concern here is that it might di uh, discourage care that that patients are seeking. So there's a real challenge with patients wanting to get certain types of services and the HM, uh, the, uh, in this type of system, clinicians might not offer that to them. They might say, no, we're going to try and save money in the system by not offering those services. So, um, so there's concerns around that. Um, also, um, sometimes uh, it might encourage referral to uh, specialists uh, if, um, you know, getting a, uh, a patient off your plate, essentially as a primary care clinician, uh, referring them to specialists can sort of pass the buck along to others. Um, so there are some possible challenges there as well. Another method for providing financial compensation is an episode of care. And this uh, type of approach is used very often uh, by uh, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, where essentially uh, an institution gets a, a, a set amount of money depending on the type of health problem that is, uh, that is being faced. Um, so this uh, is fairly rapid and efficient. However, uh, some concerns around it are that um, it, uh, once that money is used up, the institution doesn't get any additional money for that particular service. So that encourages the institution to get people out really fast, and maybe they haven't actually gotten all the care or aren't prepared to be released from the hospital yet. Uh, so there are real concerns around that. Also, the rates at which they're compensated sometimes are substantially lower than what you get from other types of health insurance. So um, this is a real concern uh, in terms of quality of care for people who, who are underserved or poorer populations. Another way that you can be compensated is through salary, and this is essentially like a normal job where you get paid a certain amount uh, regardless of other considerations. Uh, this is often done in government-type facilities. Um, so this may allow more focus on quality in those, in those contexts, but uh, when you get a salary and it's not connected to specific outcomes, well, 
that might discourage uh, efficiency in those in those interactions. There's a newer model which is also being used, which is called pay for performance, and this is the idea of really uh, trying to deal with some of the issues around uh, fee for service and capitation. Uh, because uh, there's some concerns around there, there in terms of the quality of, of services, healthcare services that are being provided. So here the idea is, is to measure essentially how well clinicians individually are providing services uh, and, then, uh, and then link their income to the quality of those services that they're providing. However, this is kind of challenging because it's hard to measure those uh, those the quality of those services because it's that those indices are hard to agree upon. And also, there's concern that it might disadvantage clinicians who are already in situations that are fairly challenging. So, clinicians who are working in low income, income communities or communities where uh, you know they have less resources or communities where. Uh, you know, they're doing a lot of translation. They might have a lot more challenges to providing services and quality care, and you don't want to disincentivize people to be providing services in, in those contexts, right? Uh, because it's much harder for a clinician to meet those standards than in, you know, a rich, uh, highly resourced community. All right, so let's go on and talk a little bit more about Chapter 10. So chapter 10, we're going to be discussing different types of uh, healthcare institutions, all right, and how we think about quality within those institutions. So uh, first, let's talk about inpatient facilities. So inpatient facilities um, refer to uh, uh, institutions where people actually stay within those institutions. So hospitals uh, are one example of, of that, where uh, they do uh, provide inpatient care where you can come and you can stay there. Typically, the, the intention is that that be short. Now, just to be clear, hospitals also provide a lot of outpatient services. So in many cases, you're not actually staying at the hospital for the services that you receive. But um, you can if that's necessary based upon your particular health care needs. Um, so there are general hospitals, and general hospitals really look at a wide range of different considerations. How there, there can also be specialty hospitals, where they, for, for example, focus in on pediatrics, children's hospitals, for example. Um, there's also nonprofit, for-profit, and investor-owned uh, hospitals. So most hospitals are um, are nonprofit. Uh, about ten percent are for-profit, but. Um, among those nonprofits, uh, many of them are actually private. About 50% of them are private hospitals. Um, but you do have some, some profit hospitals that are owned for, by investors and in these companies that provide healthcare services. Um, we also have long term care facilities. Um, so this is nursing homes and custodial, custodial care. Uh, that's where uh, we're providing services over long periods of time to individuals. So nursing homes uh, are a really important part of the healthcare system because we actually have well over a million people in the United States who are living in nursing homes where they're receiving regular care uh, and healthcare services. Uh, there's about well over 16,000 of them spread out across the country. And there's many for people who want to be engaged in healthcare services uh, and are interested in geriatrics, geriatrics. There's a lot of really important services that can be offered to elderly populations. So another really important form of inpatient uh, facility. Then we also have outpatient facilities. So outpatient facilities are um, uh, facilities where we are, uh, people are not actually staying at those facilities. So these, this would be the, uh, you know, neighborhood clinics. So most of us go to a, a doctor's office or is, um, a healthcare clinician of some sort where, um, you go and you talk to talk to somebody, but you don't actually. They don't have rooms. They don't for beds for you to stay in at those places. So this is where the vast majority of healthcare uh, occurs in those contexts. Um, so um, we also, uh, in terms of outpatient facilities, we also have community health centers, and community health centers are a really important part of the public health system because they are designed to. 
uh, provide services to low-income populations. They are outpatient, but they do provide a lot of different services, often on a sliding f scale fee based on people's income, for example. And uh, there's a, a legislation that has been made to fund those community health centers. And uh, they provide really essential uh, um, public health services, especially because they provide access uh, across the population. There's also other types of um, outpatient facilities where we have uh, diagnostic testing and uh, therapeutic services. So, uh, for example, if, if you have to go get an MRI, you might go to a specific diagnostic testing center. Now, when we think about these healthcare institutions, something that we have to consider is what types of quality considerations are, are they addressing? Um, so when we try and measure healthcare quality in the United States, we look at a range of different things. So um, things like access and services are available. So for a high quality healthcare system, you want people to be able to access those services. Um, so here we're looking at things like, um, um, are, are they providing the things that people need? And are people satisfied uh, with the provision, the provision of, the, of those health care services? So here we can measure it looking at, at surveys, for example. Um, we also want to make sure that healthcare systems have qualified qualify providers. So are they licensed appropriately? Um, so you want to make sure here that they have uh, healthcare institutions have appropriate measures for ensuring that people have the right credentials and make sure that they're up to date, for example, and checking them. Um, and, uh, and that uh, patients are happy with the services that they've been provided uh, as they're going through that. So another thing that we'd also want to consider is, uh, are there ways that uh, healthcare systems, are they effectively uh, helping people stay healthy? Um, so this can be partially through uh, prevention, but also following guidelines uh, to ensure that people are uh, getting their tests regularly, for example. And this can be verified by looking at, uh, you know, records and other things like that, uh, and looking at uh, what patients have to say about their experiences. You also want to make sure that uh, people are being helped in terms of getting better. If they come in and they have a, a healthcare problem, we're making sure that they have uh, access to the most recent services that are available, the new technologies that are needed, um, that they uh, have uh, access to different services that they need to uh, go through this illness process to come out, come out better. And you can, again, look at this using clinical records or look at staff uh, experiences with doing this. A lot of people have illnesses that will be chronic. So as you get older, um, uh, a very large portion of, of the U.S. population and uh, many of the population across the entire population, regardless of age, has certain chronic conditions that they have to continuously deal with. And um, a good healthcare system has systems in place to help those people, uh, monitoring their healthcare conditions, helping them receive the services that they need, uh, and uh, making sure that these chronic conditions don't progress to be to be worse. So again, here we get to look at things like records and uh, uh, staff experiences uh, with providing those services. So in uh, healthcare institutions, a major consideration is how effectively uh, these institutions are trying to coordinate the care of uh, patients. So a major concern that's often mentioned by patients is feeling lost in the healthcare system. Healthcare systems are very complex. And for people who um, have lower literacy, for people who have a wide range of different challenges, for actually uh, people who have mental health challenges, actually dealing with that care uh, and dealing with that coordination of care can be incredibly challenging. So there's a real interest in um, having uh, public health systems that uh, really, and healthcare systems that really do uh, consider that coordination to ensure uh, good, good health services. So in terms of coordinating care, you really want to make sure that there's a good uh, clinician-patient relationship. Uh, that relates to some of the things I discussed earlier in terms of continuity in that relationship uh, and having that relationship over time. But we know that there is um, very often we're using team approaches. Uh, uh, there's a lot of turnover in terms of professionals that you're working with. 
Um, and uh, so there's some challenges for ensuring that clinician-patient relationship. We also uh, want to think about institutional coordination, that's stepping away from the individual coordination to thinking about how you do that within uh, ensuring that um, an individual healthcare needs is connecting across an institution so that uh, uh, that different um, um, different information is conveyed within that institution, uh, that administrative decision making considers them across the institution, uh, and that that we have uh, that the information doesn't get lost in that in that process. So um, there is a range of different problems with this. Uh, the uh, sometimes that information doesn't get communicated between inpatient and outpatient facilities. Uh, there's a range of different structures uh, that sometimes don't uh, mesh as well as we'd like them to. Uh, then we have financial coordination, which is a real challenge. So for patients, one of the major concerns is how do I pay for this and how do we ensure that uh, healthcare services are provided when they're needed. So taking care of that is a real challenge within the healthcare system. So um, ensuring that we have that comprehensive uh, um, uh, uh, coverage is really important, especially given that uh, we have a wide range of different insurance processes and there's often gaps. So um, having efficient ways of doing that, having efficient administration, administrative processes is something that we will want to, um, to think about. Um, and also communicating that with uh, patients is also really important. Um, we also want to think about coordination between uh, uh, healthcare systems and public health systems. So um, remember, sometimes we have certain services that are provided in uh, healthcare systems where there'd also be benefits that people could connect to public health systems in the general population. So some people might get their testing in, uh, you know, say STD testing in uh, their clinic, but sometimes they actually uh, would benefit from going to public health uh, clinics to actually get uh, services that are cheaper for them, for example. Or they might want to take advantage of uh, different types of public health uh, access uh, for uh, something like exercise programs or other things like that. So um, we do have a challenge uh, that we've uh, had uh, perpetually in, in public health of really communicating between public health systems and uh, healthcare systems. Uh, that communication isn't as, always as good as it should be. Uh, electronic medical records is another thing that we've really been thinking about a lot to, in terms of improving uh, these types of considerations. Um, uh, we've, we are, the hope for using electronic medical, medical records is that by having that central repository that will have uh, better access to that information uh, and data uh, that will be able to use it regularly, that there'll be coordination uh, and decision, uh, decision support management for the, for the patients, uh, that there'll be better communication with those patients, uh, and uh, that, um, that when you get new results, when you get uh, drug, drug medications, for example, that it will be coordinated in that central area. Uh, we also want to think about... Uh, uh, the administrative processes and uh, that this can help coordinate. And uh, the fact that uh, by gathering all this information in central repositories, that we can actually do some research to try and figure out how to improve uh, these health systems much more effectively because that data is there in, uh, in, a, in a format that we can more easily uh, do studies on to understand what's going on. All right, so chapter 11, uh, we are talking a little bit about the healthcare system and uh, health insurance policies. So um, in the United States, we spend a tremendous amount of money on healthcare. So we know that we spend about $3 trillion on healthcare every year, and that's a huge expenditure for the United States, about 18% of our GDP. Um, actually, it's $9,000 per person per year, but it's actually more than that. It's, I think it's in 10 or 11,000 now uh, because prices continue to, to go up. Um, we know that 
in other countries, it's a much smaller burden in terms of gross domestic, domestic product, and they spend much less per person uh, per year. So we have in our healthcare system in the United States, we have a lot of real substantial challenges uh, for the provision of, of healthcare. So some real concerns there. Now, we have had changes recently with the uh, having the Affordable Care Act. Um, this is a f um, based on older data. Some of the newer data hasn't come out, but uh, the Affordable Care Act really allowed us to expand uh, access to health care for many folks. So we had a reduction of about 60 million people who uh, gained access to health care through the ACA. Um, and we also see expansion, uh, Medicaid expansion, which is also really important. Uh, uh, and um, by having more people having access to health care, uh, we're hoping, hoping to deal with some of these challenges that have been addressed. Now, there are uh, a lot of, there's a lot of controversy around the ACA, and it's something that we're dealing with uh, as a society. I have no idea what, uh, by the time you, <laughs> when, you view, when you're viewing this, what it's going to actually look like, uh, because there's uh, constant conversations about uh, the different provisions in the ACA and whether or not they'll be ma maintained. Um, one thing that I would just note from this is the major component to healthcare insurance in the United States is actually employment, employer-based insurance. So, uh, so the employer-based insurance covers most of it, but there are many other um, components to the healthcare system that are really important as well. All right. So let's talk first off. Talk about Medicare. So Medicare is one of the major. Uh, ways in which pe people can access healthcare in the United States. It's uh, a federal program uh, that is funded through a payroll tax where uh, the employee and the employer gets uh, taxed to provide uh, provide this. So you, it, as you're employed, you'll see this uh, in um, taking out of your uh, your check every every month or week. Um, it's focused in on uh, older populations, so people who are 65 or older, or people who have disability or end renal disease, um, and um, and it uh, helps them with that. This actually applies to a wide range of different folks, about 50 million people in, in the United States. Um, so it, it comes in uh, four different parts. Part A really covers hospital care, uh, skilled uh, nursing care, and home health. Uh, it can also cover hospitalization and hospice care. However, it does not come cover uh, nursing care. It also doesn't cover things like eyeglasses, uh, which a lot of elder, elderly folks need, or hearing aids, which is also really important to quality of life. Uh, there's a, you can also pay in for more for the supplementary insurance, which helps cover other types of services. Um, there's Part C, which uh, really uh, helps... Um, uh, encourage people to enroll in uh, prepaid health plans. Um, and it uh, also has Part D, which is the most recent part to it, which essentially helps provide coverage for prescription prescri 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 drug benefits. So it's important to know what these different components are because people will be talking about them if you ever work with people who are on Medicare. So Medicaid is... Uh, uh, healthcare services that are, that are offered to folks who are lower income. And this is a federal uh, program that interacts with the state program. So it's partially paid through the federal program and partially paid through states. Um, so the way that this looks like um, really varies depending on the state that, state that you're in. They typically provide um, uh, basic services. Um, so uh, here we're talking about basic services to low income folks, uh, to people who are disabled, to children and pregnant women, for example, it covers about 50 million Americans. Um, and it's primarily focused in on people who are low income, and that counts as uh, a um, under $25,000 per year for a family of four, and that varies a little bit depending on the composition. But um, but uh, essentially there are restrictions there. Now, now uh, Medicaid has also been expanded uh, so uh, many states have chosen to expand Medicaid so that people, uh, I think it's up to 183% of that uh, lower level um, uh, for that poverty uh, cutoff can actually gain access to these services. So uh, something that's uh, a component to 
Uh, the Affordable Care Act also is that Medicaid can be expanded more broadly to the general public for people who are uninsured. So, um, oh, sorry. Uh, so here again, we're talking about the idea that it can be expanded to, to more folks, up to 183 percent of uh, the um, of the basic level, um, and um, it also uh, provides uh, matching funds to uh, the states that that do this. So the states are only responsible for this. It's an interaction between the two. Um, so some benefits of Medicaid is the fact that it does provide services that aren't covered by Medicare. For example, eyeglasses and, and drugs and other types of services like that. It also is the main provider of services for, for nursing care. Um, so uh, for older populations, the way that their uh, care in nursing homes is, um, is through Medicaid, actually. Um, and... Uh, so one of the concerns, though, with Medicaid is that uh, the remember the DRG, the um, the um, the form of compensation to uh, diagnostic related groups of compensation to clinicians is actually relatively low. So unfortunately, a lot of um, healthcare providers won't actually take Medicaid um, in their clinics. So uh, that can sometimes create a shortage and a real burden for people who are trying to access services who are lower income because they can't find providers who will offer them health care uh, based upon Medicaid. So um, the provision of uh, health services through employment-based insurance is about 50% of of the American public. So it really is the largest category for insurance coverage. So there's a range of different approaches for employment-based uh, uh, insurance. One is fee-for-service. Um, so here where you're being paid based upon um, uh, the services that are provided. Um, so uh, direct payment. Um, then you also have HMOs. So HMOs use capitation. Uh, so they charge a general fee, but they um, the clinicians get paid that general fee, but the, the incentive here is to perhaps decrease those overall expenditures for, for folks uh, um, in these health management organizations. So um, uh, the idea here is to shift more towards prevention because it's the interest of the provider and the, and the uh, healthcare institution to decrease the overall use of that service. Then we have PP PPOs and POSs. Uh, which refer to preferred provider organizations and point of service plans. These are essentially ways where um, they sort of moderate the fee for service and the HMO structures. So PPOs are where you have a fee for service approach. However, um, they do allow people to go outside. Uh, they they do have a they have a set of providers that are preferred. So they are they will be cheaper. Uh, for people who uh, have a, are in that PPO. So if people want to go outside of that, they have to pay more. And this sort of helps them ensure quality so that, that helps them have a little bit more control because those providers have agreed to use certain processes uh, and provide cheaper, cheaper care. Point of ser uh, service plans are where people are in, are in those HMOs, but they are uh, uh, are allowed to go to providers outside of those HMOs for an additional fee. So instead of only having to use providers who are in that HMO, they can go outside as well. So the, that's POSs. All right, so the ACA legislation is actually really important to understand, especially because it's uh, currently in flux. Um, so there's a few different provisions to the ACA that are really relevant. One is the fact that you can't deny people insurance for pre-existing conditions, which is a really important change, important change for healthcare. Uh, that you can always be, you can't be kicked off of your insurance. That there's caps on, uh, lifetime and annual coverage, uh, that used to exist that have been eliminated in, in this approach so that you can't use up all your healthcare and then not have any money, uh, based upon your program. Uh, there's caps on out-of-pocket uh, expenditures if you have a medical emergency. 
uh, and that uh, dependent children can stay on health care up to the age of 26. Uh, there's some other things that are components this, and the, the individual mandate is one of them, which is one of the more controversial things, which require that everyone have health insurance or pay an additional tax if they want to not have uh, uh, insurance. Um, so a lot of people um, are opposed to this based upon civil liberties type concerns. Um, but it's a really uh, a key component to be able to fund uh, the ACA uh, approach. There's also uh, employer mandates, which requires larger uh, companies to actually provide health care insurance to their employees. Um, and uh, the goal to doing a lot of this is to encourage cost sharing uh, within, uh, within the healthcare system. So um, the other thing that the AC allows is expanding uh, Medicaid. So uh, this can uh, uh, in, uh, increase the expansion of Medicaid up to 133% of the federal pover poverty level. Um, so that's uh, pretty exciting uh, for folks. Uh, we can also see um, that uh, there are uh, exchanges developed by the ACA legislation. So um, the, uh, these exchanges are where you have different uh, companies that are uh, that offer different types of uh, programs to the public, so you can have choices among them. There's been some challenges with that in terms of ensuring that uh, there's enough options available for people because they haven't worked so well in certain states. Um, so some challenges there, um, and there's some uh, barriers to that um, partially put in by, uh, at, a, at a national level. So um, having good and healthy exchanges is something that's a really important thing for the ACA to continue to work. Um, and uh, then there's also requirements that these uh, ex that these exchanges uh, and these different programs include certain types of um, benefits. So, for example, you have to have health uh, mental health benefits, uh, and uh, you know there's a range of different things that very often uh, insurance companies wouldn't cover that they now have to co cover as part of those benefit packages. So that's actually really important because many of those were sort of things that people didn't think of to have included in the packages, but they actually do have major health uh, impacts. So there's a few things that we expect coming from the ACA, and we've actually seen a lot of data suggesting that it does have these benefits uh, to a large extent. It's been actually a very successful program on the whole. Um, so there's more protections for individuals and families. There are fewer uninsured, uh, as I spoke to you earlier, about 60 million less people uh, who are uninsured. Uh, there should be more standardization in terms of consistency across coverage. Um, uh, there is more competition, perhaps, for offering insurance and ways in which you can, within these exchanges, compare that insurance. Um, we're hoping that, uh, as I mentioned, there's problems with these exchanges and there's a real need for expansion of them going forward. And we want, um, we also, we do uh, expect that um, there is going to be higher taxes for higher income folks. So uh, that's because a lot of the, the tax structure for passing the ACA really did uh, increase the uh, expenditures that higher, higher income uh, folks would have to pay to make that happen. And that's, again, a polit politically contentious move. Um, and there's uh, going to need to be continuing efforts to control costs because even though we have the ACA, even with the ACA attempts to decrease the increase uh, in costs, it wasn't actually something that was expected to actually make costs decrease in the United States. We still have problems of increasing costs in the United States, and that's something that uh, we need to keep on considering as a society. Um, so there's a few different things that we want to think about when we want to assess healthcare systems. So um, how do we finance it? Uh, thinks about th thinking about uh, ways that we provide insurance and reimbursement. Uh, d delivery of system, uh, uh, services, how comprehensive the insurance is that we're being, uh, that's been being offered, um, ways that we can actually improve costs and cost con containment, um, how much choice we offer patients, and the different considerations re with respect to administrative costs, which are actually really high in healthcare systems. We spend about 30% of our money in healthcare systems on administration, not even on provision of healthcare itself. 
So when we look at healthcare systems and we assess healthcare systems upon a range of different metrics, here we're looking at the um, uh, uh, five different axes of care by the Commonwealth Fund Commission. And we find that in the United States, we're still having real big problems. Um, so this is done early on in the ACA. I think some of this data is actually from, I think most of this data is from before the ACA. But if you look across the 11 country, uh, countries in this chart, you'll see that the United States isn't doing so well for many of them. When it comes to quality of care, we're doing okay. Um, not the highest, but okay. Um, but uh, with respect to a lot of other things, for example, equity and uh, uh, efficiency and a few other th different things that we want to consider, we're not doing so well. We're 11th in the, a, a lot of those categories. So um, there's, uh, we're also spending more than any of those other countries on providing healthcare. So there's a lot of things to think about in terms of the provision of healthcare and how we can improve that going forward. All right, chapter 12. So here we're going to talk a little bit about public health systems that are in place to ensure public health. All right, so we've talked previously about the 10 essentials of public health, the idea that we want to monitor health overall to see what's going on, that we want to, if we're seeing problems, that we diagnose and investigate those problems through that, uh, that assessment phase. Uh, in terms of policy development, we want to make sure that we're informing, educating, empowering people so that if there's a health problem, that they know what to do and how to address those health problems. Uh, this is done often most effectively by mobilizing and interacting with community partners, that we bring people together to address these public health problems, and that, you know, together we can also find problems that we can address through changing policies. Um, and that's a major consideration as well. Now, policies, for policies to work, you actually have to enforce them. So here we think about public health insurance as well, that we have to have a way of ensuring that uh, that these policies are enforced. So if you have uh, seatbelt laws and nobody pays attention to them, well, they're not going to help people too much. So um, we also want to have systems for connecting people with health care that they need. So if lower income folks uh, uh, aren't having access to care, um, we want to make sure that they can find it, that they have providers who take Medicaid, for example. Um, we also want to make sure that our workforce is uh, prepared to provide health care services. So we know that um, you know, we, we want to make sure that if clinicians aren't quite prepared or are having trouble, trouble keeping up with, um, information about healthcare that we have, that they, that there's ways of monitoring that. We also want to make sure that we have enough healthcare providers in different areas. For example, the nursing shortage, that we have enough nurses to provide services. Then we also have the evaluation component that we want to be constantly monitoring the public health system to ensure that we have improvement. And that's really connects into the research, which is at the center. Research at the center uh, brings up the idea that all of these different components require research to actually do this well, that we need to have evidence, that we need to have an understanding of any of these components to actually do them well. So when it comes to the public health system, there are different components that make it up. So we have uh, public health agencies at the center here. So public health ag agencies range from local organizations, you know, uh, you know, the King County Public Health or Snow Hill Health District, our local groups. We also have state, uh, the state public health agencies. We have them at a federal level, and we also have global public health agencies. Uh, then we have the healthcare delivery system. So uh, here we're thinking about hospitals and healthcare and healthcare quality. Then we have community uh, and private organizations, nonprofit organizations, non-governmental organizations that do the, that are engaged with uh, health-related considerations. And we have other governmental agencies that are also uh, care about uh, issues that are related to public health. So, for example, we know that education is strongly associated with uh, health outcomes, but they're the main focus of that those agencies aren't necessarily health itself. Right. So we have um, other types of organizations that make up this public health system. So local health departments. So local health departments are really important for ensuring that public health is provided within specific regions. So um, here we think about immunizations. They do things like monitoring, surveilling for outbreaks in, in our local communities. They do a lot of things around communicable disease control in that context. Uh, they do a lot of inspection and licensing. For example, they check restaurants to see 
uh, if they have good food handling practices, for example. They also look at environmental considerations like water quality. Um, they do, they're often engaged in screening programs, uh, helping people with quitting smoking. Um, they also are engaged with emergency response. So if we had an earthquake in our region, what, how would we deal with that? Uh, state health departments are also really important because they uh, oversee the local departments. Uh, so they uh, collect data from around the state. They uh, 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 run the, uh, public health laboratories for uh, assessing whether or not there's uh, contaminants, for example, or uh, infectious diseases in foods or other things like that. They also are really engaged in ideas around uh, licensing health professionals to make sure that they're, we have a good, strong workforce. They engage in the, the nutrition programs. Uh, they look at um, uh, different health facilities, uh, healthcare institutions, making sure that they're doing doing work well. Um, they also look at uh, drinking water and uh, ensure that uh, drinking water regulations are uh, protect, uh, protected. They are in charge of the Medicaid program for the state uh, and also uh, are in charge of the medical examiner who looks for potential health problems, right? Uh, we also have federal agencies uh, in uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. That would be the main one that we have to think about is the CDC. Um, the CDC uh, is a, really in charge of public health systems for the United States. Uh, so they do a lot of the research uh, for that. Um, they also uh, are, uh, they oversee the Agency for Toxic Substances and uh, Disease Registry, which uh, thinks about uh, looking at toxins, looking at environmental exposures, right? Um, so they're a very key component to public health processes. We also have the National Institutes of Health. The National Institutes of Health is um, the agency that really looks at healthcare research, Across the country, uh, across the country, so they um, they do uh, a lot of work to think about how uh, across their different institutions to think about how we address things like diabetes, how we look at things like genetics and genomics, how we think about things like eye diseases. So they do a lot of the a lot of this work. Uh, we have the Food and Drug Administration, which uh, looks at things like foods, uh, making sure that they're of high quality, that there aren't contaminants, other things like that. Uh, uh, and then drugs, they monitor drugs to make sure that the process of developing drugs, that they have good evidence for effectiveness and that there aren't negative health impacts due to those drugs. Uh, then we have the uh, HRSA, which really looks at ensuring equitable access to uh, good, high-quality health care. So they do, do a lot of research in this area um, to uh, improve access to health care. Uh, and then we have AHRQ. Uh, this is again uh, a, a research that does a ton of research, an uh, 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 agency that does a ton of research around ensuring patient safety and quality of healthcare services and access to services. So, for example, they uh, support the U.S. Preventive Services Tax Force, where they uh, essentially do reviews of all different techniques that can be used in clinical care and recommend what uh, primary care should be doing to uh, ensure. Uh, different types of basic high quality healthcare services. Then we have uh, SAM SAMHSA, uh, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. This is really uh, the organization that uh, looks at uh, substance use and mental health uh, and tries to create uh, good systems and good supports for people who are dealing with those challenges. So they do a lot of research in these, these areas. Um, then we have the uh, Indian Health Services. Uh, so Indian Health Services are really important because they provide uh, uh, services to a distinct and marginalized community. So uh, they uh, provide a wide range of different health care to uh, federally recognized tribes um, on, on, in reservations on site. Uh, so a very important service in those contexts. Um, if we expand out uh, from from the United States uh, to global levels. We also have a range of different global uh, public health organizations. So the World Health Organization uh, is focused in different seven different regions and uh, it does things a lot of things around policy development, uh, coordinating services, especially in terms of uh, dealing with communicable diseases. Uh, but they also deal with environmental issues as well. 
Um, uh, they also do a lot of data collection. So if you go to the WHO website, you can find out a lot of information about different countries and how they're doing in terms of um, in terms of uh, healthcare provision and health impacts. Um, but they have sort of limited abilities to deal with some health things because they can't enforce a lot of their recommendations. Uh, then we also have uh, international organizations that have sort of more focused public health thing uh, focuses like uh, UNICEF or UNAIDS, focusing on uh, children, ch childhood vaccination and uh, uh, AIDS preve prevention, HIV prevention. So they can have these limited agendas where they're really focusing on, on dealing with them. Uh, we have uh, uh, the World Bank, international fin uh, financial organizations. The World Bank is an important one to consider in particular because they do a lot of work around uh, trying to support local governments and obviously a lot of controversy around uh, World Bank and how it does this. But they do engage with trying to build, uh, address public health problems to build capacity for those countries. Uh, so nutrition or other types of considerations. Um, then we also have uh, bilateral governmental aid organizations. So this can happen, for example, uh, international aid organizations that come, for example, from uh, countries. So, uh, for example, the United States runs a U.S. aid program, which looks at HIV around the globe, right? So it tries to prevent, prevent it internationally. Um, and... So these types of organizations can provide real benefits, but they often are really tied to national or specific interests that are specific to the uh, funding uh, body that pr provides that service. Um, so um, moving on to talk a little bit about healthcare systems. Um, healthcare systems are uh, a way of combining uh, or systems thinking is a way of combining all of these different issues around healthcare systems to think more effectively about healthcare problems. So in, when we're thinking about systems thinking, we're really comparing reductionist thinking versus systems thinking. So reductionist thinking is where you sort of focus in on one specific element of a problem and kind of ignore the other problems. And that's where you say, all right, um, Smoking is just about, you know, if we were to solve smoking, all we have to do is get people to believe that, um, that cigarettes are bad, right? Well, that ignores a lot of different things. It ignores things like different social pressures to uh, address smoking. It ignores uh, national regulation around smoking. It ignores a whole lot of different things about this whole complex system that determine whether or not people actually... Uh, engage in smoking, for example, right? So system thinking is the idea that if we really want to effectively engage with public health problems, that we have to think in, about them in a more complex way. So what are the steps in systems thinking? So uh, the first component is really, first off, you have to figure out what are the influences on this public health problem? Uh, then you have to look at those different influences and you have to parse them out based on how strong of an influence they have. Um, then you want to think about how those different influences interact to affect the health problem. Um, so uh, which ones are connected to which ones? You also want to look at feedback loops. So feedback loops are the ways in which they interact so that they can improve uh, health problems or uh, they can interact to make them much, much worse, right? Um, uh, you also want to identify possible bottlenecks. So these are areas where... Uh, you have a problem that's preventing um, positive benefits from occurring across that system. So if you can find those bottle bottlenecks, those provide uh, ideas for us around what uh, leverage points we might have. So where, where are the opportunities where putting in additional effort, effort would make a substantial benefit for dealing with, the, with those public health problems? So if you look at the healthcare, uh, healthcare systems thinking, if you look at the problem of um, motor vehicle collisions and the health impacts of those injuries, you can, you can view that as just being an accident that we can't do anything about. But if we th really think about motor vehicle accidents, well, there's a lot of different things that we can do to actually uh, improve on this problem. 
So if we were to think about this as a systems type problem, you might think about, okay, what are the contributors to this? So it might be things like alcohol, drinking alcohol, or it might be things like speeding. People who speed, drive too fast, it might increase uh, motor vehicle collisions. Having slower responses or texting. Slower responses might be connected to age, or it might be because people are messing around te texting. Or there might be road safety technologies that might uh, decrease those uh, motor vehicle accidents. Or there might be uh, uh, collision prevention technologies, right? Um, so you have the vehicle collision, which results in injuries. And uh, you could have different things that could, safety technologies that could uh, address uh, 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 injuries or uh, restraint technologies like uh, seat belts or uh, airbags or things like that. Now, injuries can actually influence things like the emergency uh, response system. Uh, so how, how quickly can we get to people get, and get them to the hospital and get a response? So they find for motor vehicles, if you get to people within the first hour after the get, get uh, hospital care, within the first hour, their likelihood of surviving goes way, way, way up. So the, the interest there is really speeding up the speed at which you can deal with those emergency situations. And ultimately, this leads to disability and death. So the goal here in looking at the system, system is we want to decrease that disability and death outcome. So what you do to think about this in system thinking is you look at um, trying to figure out which factors are most important for uh, influencing motor vehicle collisions. So it, it looks like speeding, alcoholism, and, and slow response are the major contributors there. So they, uh, all of those three things, if you look at the, the size of those arrows, they're bigger arrows indicating a bigger mag magnitude. Well, they're, they're big, have a big impact on the likelihood of having an accident. Um, also, if you look at the plus or minus signs, the plus or minus signs indicates whether something is increasing or increasing the thing that is pointing to. All right. Um, you can have positive feedback loops. So positive feedback loops where, for example, texting is increasing a slow response, which is in turn increasing motor vehicle accidents. So they're all contributing to one another. So there's this, this positive interaction loop. Uh, you can also have negative interaction loops. So uh, in some cases, having more injuries, for example, uh, means that healthcare providers who are in those areas will have more experience dealing with those injuries, which might uh, lead them to actually having better skills and knowledge so that they can actually decrease overall death and disability. So that may be an example of how we can actually um, improve knowledge generation to increase the negative health impact. So thinking about these complex public health issues, thinking about the ways these different factors interact to solve those, uh, to to negatively impact or positively impact that can help us come up with creative solutions for dealing with these complex public health challenges. All right, so that's a very quick overview of public health systems. A lot of things to think about, a lot of information to know that's really important to be able to engage as a public health professional. Uh, so a lot to think about, and uh, hopefully it's helpful for giving you a overview of what this overall looks like in, in, uh, in the United States and, and globally. All right, so thank you very much and take care.